Whenever I was first ordained a priest, I was ordained to Our Lady of Wisdom on the UL campus. And one day after Mass, this gentleman who went to Mass very regularly uh, came out and asked me my name. So I told him my name, and he said, Oh, I'm not going to call you Father, because the Bible says that we should call no man our Father. I said, That's, that's great. I said, I love that, that verse from Scripture. It's beautiful. I said, I really enjoy reading Scripture. I said, You know what another one of the Scriptures that I like is? He said, Oh, Father, what's that? I said, I love that passage that we just heard. That passage uh, where you know Jesus says, If you sin with your hand, you should cut it off. If you sin with your eye, you should pluck it out. I love that. And he said, oh yeah, Father, I like that too. So I said, great. I said, how come no one's walking around with hands cut off and eyes plucked out? Does nobody sin? His face kind of fell. He said, oh, Father, I I don't know. I said, well, that's because some scriptures were meant to take literally and some scriptures were not. And so I went on and made another point to him about, you know, why the church is the true interpreter of the scriptures. But I think that's an important thing to remember when we read this passage today, right? We're not going to go home and cut our hands off. But Jesus is speaking in hyperbole, right? He is trying to make an outrageous statement for the sake of making a point, right? He's trying to make the point that we cannot tolerate sin in our lives. That we as Christians cannot be comfortable with any degree of sin that is in our lives. Right? We should not play around with evil. Uh, we can't allow room for anything that separates us from God. Right? If we're serious about this journey, this Christian way, then we have to do Uh, everything we can to get rid of sin and evil in our lives, right? That saying uh, that we hear is true about evil probably more than anything else. That if you give it an inch, it's going to take a mile. If we allow sin in our lives and we're comfortable with it, it's going to overtake us. So what is the lesson for us? What should we actually do if we're not supposed to go and cut our hands and our feet off and pluck our eyes out, what should we do? Well, we should examine our lives and see if we've fallen into that trap, right, of allowing sin to remain, if we've become comfortable in our sin, right? Well, I don't do anything too bad. This is my favorite confession to hear. Well, Father, it's been, you know, 30 or 40 years, but I haven't killed anybody. Okay. That's a good start. I'm happy you haven't killed anybody. But if the Christian life becomes whether or not we kill someone, we're missing the point. Right? We have to examine our lives and see if we have allowed ourselves to be comfortable with our sin. Whatever it might be. We should examine our lives and see if we become okay with evil being present in our lives. And then we have to work To root it out. We cannot allow evil to remain in us. We have to look for those near occasions of sin. Those things that are tempting for us. Those situations that we know, well if I do this or that, I am more likely to sin. And then we try to avoid those things. We try to avoid those things that are going to lead us down that path of evil and sin. Uh, I'm listening to this audiobook that's called 48 Laws of Power. And it's a decent book, but it's a very worldly idea of power. Right? How do we gain power for the sake of uh, worldly goods? But there are a few good things in it. And the 15th law that this gentleman uh, presents uh, fits in nicely with this idea. He says that the 15th law is that you have to completely annihilate your enemy. We have to completely annihilate our enemy if we want to have power. And he gives examples uh, of history where a king or a ruler uh, wins a battle. They overtake some sort of power. 
But because they don't want to be too mean, they allow the person that they've beaten to remain. And that person gets angry, and that person comes up with a scheme, and that person ultimately takes back his own power, and even more. Right? He takes back what belonged to the person who had conquered him. And so this is how evil works. Right? We have to completely annihilate it. We have to get rid of it from our lives, or else right? we hear about this woman or this person who had uh, a demon cast out, And because the place was empty, seven more demons came in. We have to cast out evil completely. And then we have to place good in its place. We have to invite Christ in. We have to invite God in to take the place of the evil that was in us. Now, we have to, as I mentioned, uh, get rid of those near occasions of sin. If I struggle with drinking then it's probably not a good idea for me to go sit in the bar or to constantly keep alcohol at my house. It's too tempting. I have to get rid of it. I have to completely annihilate that temptation. If someone struggles with gambling, they shouldn't go to the casino. They shouldn't maybe keep a lot of cash on them at all times. We should set up our lives in a way that those temptations are lessened. Right? If someone struggles with lust, they shouldn't sit in front of the computer all day. Right? This, this completely blows my mind. I preach on this quite often. That parents, parents of young children, would give their child a cell phone with constant access to the internet. That's not very smart. Right? We're putting something in their hands that is going to most likely lead them into temptation. Right? And so it may seem like a drastic measure. But if someone struggles with lust, maybe they should get rid of their cell phone. Or get a flip phone. Right? Something that can't access the internet. Right? We have to take these steps to try to root those near occasions of sin out of our lives. So my role right now, uh, my job in the diocese is a vocation director. So I'm in charge of going around and trying to promote vocations to the priesthood, to the religious life, and try to encourage men and women who might be feeling that call to respond, to answer the call to become a priest or religious. And sort of in this line of work and in the church itself, we're seeing the results of people who have allowed evil to creep in their lives, right, to remain there. And it leads to very damaging things in the church, especially among priests. And so I ask you to pray uh, for me in my work as vocation director, but to pray for those young men and women who are thinking that God might be calling them to the priesthood or the religious life, uh, to continue to pray that those men and women who are tired of seeing evil in the world would rise up and respond to that call. And pray also for those who are currently studying in our diocese for the priesthood. We have about 40 men that are currently studying to become priests. I pray that they would be zealous, right? that they would be on fire with love for God, and that they would spend this time in the seminary wisely, rooting out and allowing God to root out evil in their lives. And pray that love, that love of God and neighbor would motivate them in everything that they do, that they do to try to be as holy as they can be and one day to help the parishioners they serve to become holy also.